SpaceX is approaching a pivotal milestone in the Starship program, the 11th integrated flight test, marking the final mission of the Block 2 vehicles before transitioning to the upgraded Block 3 design. The countdown to launch began earlier this week as Booster 15, the super heavy assigned to this mission, rolled out to the launch complex on Wednesday morning. Standing more than 72 meters tall, the booster recently completed weeks of system-level preparations at the production site, including pressure and leak tests, engine interface checks, avionics validation, and hydraulic and electrical inspections to ensure every subsystem performs within strict parameters before liftoff. Upon arriving at the launch site, the booster was lifted by the tower's chopstick arms and carefully positioned onto the orbital launch mount after which teams secured it and configured the pad interfaces for upper stage integration. Meanwhile, Ship 38, the upper stage for Flight 11, had been undergoing final rollout preparations inside Mega Bay 2, where engineers verified its engines, heat shield, avionics, and related systems, confirming full flight readiness. The ship was subsequently rolled out Saturday afternoon for stacking atop Booster 15, forming the complete Starship vehicle. Following stacking, teams will conduct integrated system tests, verifying command and telemetry links, hydraulic actuation, and propellant transfer pathways between both stages and ground systems. If all pre-flight checks proceed smoothly, launch is targeted for October 13th, marking one of the most technically significant and data-rich missions in the Starship program to date. Flight 11 on Monday will showcase several never-before-done experiments and flight maneuvers, which are crucial to be understood before the mission. Booster 15, which last flew on Flight 8, will lift off powered by 24 previously flown Raptor engines, marking only the second reflown Super Heavy. It's a major step toward making the world's largest rocket fully reusable. Reusing engines and boosters lowers operational costs while exposing the hardware to repeated thermal and mechanical stresses, providing SpaceX with critical data on durability and performance under real-world conditions. After stage separation, Booster 15 will return for a controlled splashdown in the Gulf of Mexico. About six minutes into the flight, the landing sequence will begin with a burn using 13 Raptor engines, followed by a five-engine divert phase to fine-tune its descent path. Earlier Block 2 boosters used three engines for this phase, but future Block 3 vehicles will use five, adding redundancy against unplanned engine shutdowns. The booster will then switch to its three central engines, hover briefly over the water, and complete the splashdown. This sequence is designed to measure how the vehicle responds as engines sequentially shut down and hand off control between phases, data essential for future tower catch operations. Ship 38 carries equally ambitious flight objectives. After stage separation, it will ascend to the target altitude and velocity, shut down its engines, and enter the coast phase. It will release eight Starlink simulators, mass dummies replicating the size and weight of next-generation Starlink V3 satellites. These mass simulators were loaded into the ship at the production facility prior to rollout to the launch site. Flight 10's deployment attempt resulted in two units striking the doorframe, highlighting clearance issues. Flight 11 will test improvements to the deployment system, paving the way for operational Starlink deployments in future missions. The ship will also attempt an in-orbit Raptor restart using propellant from its header tanks, demonstrating that Starship can reignite engines in space to perform controlled re-entries from low Earth orbit or deep space, ensuring safe returns. The mission also functions as a heat shield stress test. As in previous missions, engineers remove tiles in select sections to expose the underlying pyron ablative layers and KO wool blankets which would be the only protection for the stainless steel hull if tiles detached during re-entry. For the first time, tiles were also removed from areas where they are bonded directly to the stainless steel hull, with no protective layers beneath. This intentionally exposes bare steel to extreme heat, simulating a worst-case scenario where both the tiles and underlying layers are lost. By testing the stainless steel hull under re-entry heating, SpaceX can gather data and implement design improvements to ensure the vehicle can survive such conditions in future operational flights. Interestingly, tiles were installed on the leeward side of both aft flaps, a region that doesn't experience intense re-entry heating, likely to test upgraded attachment pins planned for Block 3 Starships. These pins primarily endure flight-induced stresses and vibrations rather than high re-entry heat making the leeward side a suitable location for realistic mechanical testing. Previous test flights also featured tiles on the leeward side, but the patterns differed. 
Notably, Flight 10 had tiles arranged closely together, whereas the current layout follows a staggered, chessboard-like pattern. This arrangement on the flaps allows engineers to evaluate the performance, durability, and installation process of the new attachment pins under realistic flight conditions without affecting critical areas of the vehicle. Finally, Ship 38's descent will include a banking maneuver, first perfected by the space shuttle, to survive re-entry and steer through the atmosphere. The shuttle never entered the atmosphere at a steep angle. Such an approach would have subjected it to extreme aerodynamic heating and structural loads. But if the angle was too shallow, the orbiter might not decelerate sufficiently, potentially leading to a skipped re-entry where it would re-enter the atmosphere later at a different location. Instead, it approached Earth along a narrow re-entry corridor, just a few degrees wide. Within this safe window, the orbiter skimmed through the upper layers of air, gradually bleeding off speed. Even here, its wings generated lift, and that lift vector pointed upward, tending to push the shuttle toward thinner air, where drag was weaker and braking less effective. To counter this, the shuttle performed banking maneuvers, rolling from side to side to tilt its lift vector sideways instead of upward. This allowed it to stay deeper in the atmosphere, maximize drag, and precisely control its flight path. By alternating the roll direction in a controlled pattern, S-turns, it bled off speed efficiently while keeping the vehicle on course toward the landing site. S-turns typically began around 60 to 80 kilometers altitude in the hypersonic regime, about six to eight minutes after the first energy management roll. After completing the S-turns and bleeding off the majority of orbital velocity, the shuttle transitioned to subsonic flight using ailerons, rudder, and elevons to glide toward the runway, align with it, and perform a flare for a smooth touchdown. Although Starship will not land on a runway and will instead be caught by the tower arms, its banking maneuver to bleed velocity follows the same aerodynamic principles as the shuttle. SpaceX's exact control algorithms, such as bank angles or S-turn equivalents, are proprietary and tailored to Starship's flap design. During belly flop re-entry, the ship's body and flaps naturally generate lift as a byproduct. By adjusting orientation and flap angles, Starship can direct this lift to fine-tune its trajectory, manage aerodynamic heating, and slow down efficiently. Data from this maneuver during Flight 11 and upcoming tests will allow SpaceX to refine the ship's re-entry path, orientation, and velocity, improving precision, thermal management, and alignment for future tower catches. After reaching the landing zone, Ship 38 will relight its engines, flip, and perform a controlled splashdown in the designated area of the Indian Ocean. The landing hazard zone has been reduced by nearly 30% compared to Flight 10, reflecting increased confidence in Starship's re-entry corridor and landing accuracy, thanks to high-fidelity telemetry and trajectory data gathered from previous missions. Overall, Flight 11 isn't just a repeat of Flight 10. It's a rehearsal of the techniques, technologies, and maneuvers that SpaceX intends to standardize on the path toward fully reusable orbital rockets. Pad 1's orbital launch mount is incompatible with upcoming Block 3 Starship vehicles and will be demolished after Flight 11, then rebuilt to match the upgraded design of Pad 2, which is under construction. Recently, teams removed the hydraulic actuators connected to the tower's landing rails. These actuators compress when the booster touches down, allowing the rails to move downward and absorb the landing impact. As no further booster catches are planned at Pad 1 in the near term, SpaceX has opted to remove the dampers, which will be redesigned and recalibrated for Block 3 vehicles as part of the broader pad infrastructure overhaul. Launch and catch operations are expected to resume from Pad 1 once the upgrades are complete. Until then, all Starship missions will shift to Pad 2, which, based on the current construction and testing pace, is expected to be operational by late this year or early next year. Now let's discuss the latest updates from the world of science and technology. In a major leap for space-based logistics, Inversion Space has unveiled its groundbreaking ARC spacecraft, designed to deliver cargo to any point on Earth in under an hour. Founded in 2021 and based in Los Angeles, the startup aims to revolutionize global transport by enabling rapid, precise deliveries directly from low Earth orbit to anywhere on the planet, emphasizing speed, resilience, and global reach. Earlier this year, Inversion achieved a major milestone with the launch of its Ray spacecraft, a small re-entry capsule that flew aboard a SpaceX Falcon 9 rideshare mission. Designed for missions lasting up to four weeks, Ray comprised a re-entry capsule and a service module equipped with avionics, 
solar arrays, a custom-built separation system, and a bipropellant propulsion unit for orbital maneuvers. The spacecraft successfully reached orbit and conducted extensive on-orbit tests, validating several key technologies essential for future re-entry missions. However, the mission ended without a planned re-entry attempt due to an on-orbit electrical short that prevented ignition of the deorbit engine. Despite this setback, Ray met all primary objectives and established the technological groundwork for Inversion's more advanced ARC spacecraft. Unveiled publicly on October 1st in Los Angeles, ARC is a compact, reusable vehicle measuring approximately 2.4 meters long and 1.2 meters wide. It is built from lightweight alloys and heat-resistant composite materials, featuring a modular internal structure for enhanced maintainability, adaptability, and structural integrity. ARC is engineered to withstand the extreme conditions of hypersonic atmospheric re-entry, enduring temperatures up to 3,000 degrees Celsius. Its advanced thermal protection system, developed in collaboration with NASA, uses proprietary materials to shield the vehicle during descent while maintaining aerodynamic stability. The spacecraft employs a bipropellant engine running on non-toxic propellants, complemented by a set of attitude control thrusters for fine orbital adjustments and a dedicated deorbit engine to initiate re-entry. While specific thrust figures and propellant formulations remain undisclosed, the system continues to undergo iterative refinement. Each ARC vehicle will launch as a secondary payload aboard commercial rockets, primarily SpaceX Falcon 9 missions, into low Earth orbit. Once deployed, it can remain operational for up to five years, forming part of a scalable orbital logistics constellation that could eventually number in the thousands. When called upon, ARC autonomously performs deorbit burns, executes a controlled hypersonic re-entry using its aerodynamic flaps and thrusters, and completes a parachute-assisted descent with an accuracy of within 15 meters of its target. This precision enables reliable cargo delivery to regions lacking infrastructure, including disaster zones, remote research stations, and military outposts. With a payload capacity of 225 kilograms, ARC can transport critical supplies, sensors, or equipment at unmatched speed, completing delivery from orbit to surface in under an hour. Beyond logistics, it also serves as a hypersonic flight test platform, supporting U.S. defense programs focused on advanced reentry materials and guidance systems. To date, Inversion has conducted multiple drop and aerodynamic tests to refine ARC's flight dynamics, control algorithms, and landing precision. The company has also performed a series of in-house hot-fire campaigns on ARC's bipropellant propulsion system, validating its thrust performance, restart capability, and maneuvering capability in space-like conditions. Inversion plans to conduct the first orbital demonstration flight in 2026, followed by a rapid scale-up toward hundreds of operational spacecraft by 2028. If successful, the ARC program could establish an entirely new paradigm in global logistics offering rapid, resilient, and scalable orbital delivery for both national security and commercial applications. Thank you for tuning in for the latest science news and Starship updates. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, leave a comment, and share it with your friends. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you never miss an episode.